All right, welcome to the introduction to thermochemistry. We're going to talk here about energy, exothermic, endothermic reactions, enthalpy, and a little bit about some uh, pressure volume work. But first off, we see here that energy, that's the potential or capaci capacity to move matter. Our, the joule is our SI unit, and then we have some other um, non-SI units. The little calorie, little c calorie, is 4.184 joules. A big C calorie, that's what you typically see on um, food labels. It's also called a kilocalorie, and that's a thousand of the little calories. So, you know, if someone eats a Snickers bar, they look and they see 220 calories instead of 220,000 calories with a little C. So that makes it a little bit better when you're having that Snickers break. Now, of course, we have some different types of energy. We've got kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. And it has a formula of 1 half mv squared, m being mass, v being velocity. So you can see that the velocity has a much greater effect on the kinetic energy than the mass does. Potential energy, that's the energy of position. Potential energy equals the mass of the object times gravity, which is 9.8 um, meters per second squared, and the height of the object. And then we have this stuff called internal energy, the sum of potential and kinetic energy of particles in a substance. Now, in chemistry class, we're not too worried about or concerned about kinetic energy and potential energy. We're mostly focusing on the potential and kinetic energy of the particles in a substance, our internal energy. So as it says here, total energy would be kinetic plus potential plus internal, but in lab, we're really just focusing on the internal energy. All right. We also have, of course, this law of conservation of energy, just like we have the law of conservation of mass. It says that energy can be converted from one form to another, but the total quantity of energy remains constant. And so that's a fundamental law here that we abide by. And it'll show its head in some different forms throughout the year. but just wanted to remind you that we have such law. Heat. I know, awesome graphic, thanks. Heat is the energy that flows into or out of a system because there's a difference in temperature between the system and the surroundings. Heat has a symbol of Q, little q. And so if you're looking at, let's say, this Erlenmeyer flask, and this Erlenmeyer flask has a solution of barium hydroxide and ammonium nitrate, the system is that solution. The surroundings is everything else around it. So I, we're typically talking about the near vicinity of the Erlenmeyer flask. But you know, technically, Jupiter is outside of the system. So Jupiter is part of the surroundings. But again, we really just talk about things that are directly in contact with the system. More importantly, in thermal contact. Because as it says, as long as a system and the surroundings are in said thermal contact with each other, heat will always flow from the region of higher temperature to lower temperature, from higher to lower until thermal equilibrium is reached. So when we're going to do a specific heat lab, we put hot metal into colder water, and the heat will flow from that hot metal into the colder water until the temperature levels out and we see that thermal equilibrium has been reached. Now the heat of reaction, that's the value of Q that's required to return a system back to the start. So when you have a reaction and we either have energy going into the system or out of the system, then the heat of reaction is how much the value of Q that would require to make it go back to where it came from. So we could have a positive or negative Q value. We might have to add heat back to the system, or we might have to remove heat from the system. And so this is where we see our good friends endothermic and exothermic. All right. When heat is going into the system from the surroundings, that's when we have an endothermic situation, and the Q value is positive. When heat is going from the system to the surroundings, when heat is exiting the system, we have an exothermic situation, 
and our Q value is negative. So you really want to make sure you mark that down and understand when Q is positive endothermic, Q is negative exothermic. Enthalpy, very Halloween related font there. Enthalpy is what we call an extensive property of a substance. And this can be used to obtain the heat absorbed or released in a chemical reaction. So we can use enthalpy to determine how much heat has been absorbed or released during a chemical reaction. So I know you're thinking, what's an extensive property? Good question. An extensive property totally depends on the amount of substance, okay? Like the mass of the substance or the volume of the substance. The more there is, then the more of that property would be displayed. And we'll see that here in a minute. Okay, um, going back to that hot metal example. If I put a little tiny piece of hot metal into water, we're not going to see a lot of heat released. If I put a huge chunk of metal that's hot into water, much more heat would be released. That's an extensive property. Enthalpy is also what we call a state function. And this is a property that depends only on the present state perhaps temperature or pressure. And it is independent of any previous history of the system. What does this really mean? A change in enthalpy does not depend on how the change was made, but only on the initial and final states of the system. And here you see a diagram of some mountain climbers. Okay, if everyone starts here and finishes there, we're all gonna have the same change in altitude, delta A. Okay, it does not matter that one group went way over here, and then way over there, and then here, and then here, and another group took a more direct route. What matters is, start to finish, we all have the same, and that's what's called a state function. And we'll use that quite often throughout this unit. So the enthalpy of reaction, this would be the change in enthalpy for a reaction at a given temperature and pressure. So delta H, this enthalpy of reaction, is you take the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. Typically, in lab, we're running reactions at a constant pressure. There's not much you can do to dramatically alter the atmospheric pressure around a reaction we're running in lab. And so when that is the case, we say that delta H, the change in enthalpy, the enthalpy of reaction, is equal to Q the heat of the reaction. And that'll be very helpful to us as we do these different calculations. Again, this is just a couple other ways you can look at, but really understand that when heat goes from the surroundings into the system, my Q is positive, it's endothermic, and delta H is greater than zero. I really kind of muddled that all up. I'd rather highlight it for you. Heat goes in, Q is positive, that's endothermic, that means we have a delta H greater than zero. If heat is leaving the system, Q is negative, that's exothermic, delta H is less than zero. So we have this little tie together between enthalpy and the internal energy which is what the type of energy we're really focused on in chemistry class. Enthalpy, H, is defined as our internal energy, U, plus pressure times volume. So in reaction form, H is equal to U plus PV. So if we're running a reaction at constant pressure, I can look at the change in enthalpy and the change in internal energy and the change in volume. And again, the pressure is constant. And I can rearrange those variables, and I get this equation. Delta U, the change in internal energy, is equal to the change in enthalpy, delta H, minus P delta V. And this P delta V takes on an important name called pressure volume work. And that is the energy of a system to change volume against constant atmospheric pressure. So really, we're focusing on reactions that will produce a gas. So if we have a reaction, and here's one view of it, it's in a vessel here at an initial state, and then in the final state, it produced gas that caused a change in volume, a delta V, 
then we would see this pressure volume work. Classic example, let's say we take a piece of sodium metal and place it into water. When that happens, of course, we produce hydrogen gas and some aqueous sodium hydroxide. So if you were in this vessel and we had a little weight on this piston, but as the reaction went and we produced the hydrogen gas, then we would see a change in volume. Also note that negative 368.6 kilojoules. There's 368.6 kilojoules released. So if I wanted to calculate the change in internal energy, it would be delta H minus P delta V. And so in a setting, and this is measured, there's my delta H, negative 368.6. And then calculated from an experiment, P delta V is 2.5. And so ultimately, we see the change in internal energy is negative 371.1 kilojoules. Why is this important? Delta U is very close to delta H, which is usually the case. So in other words, our heat of reaction is basically equal to the change in internal energy. The only time there's a slight difference, again, is perhaps when a gas is being produced in a reaction. But you can see it's not that big of a deal. So we will always assume that the change in internal energy is going to be equal to the change in enthalpy. All right. So that's our beginnings of thermochemistry. Next, we'll take a look at thermochemical equations and working with those. And then we'll look at calorimetry, Hess's law, and some standard enthalpies of formation. So hope this helps, and see you soon.